Hello, and welcome to uh, How to Diorama with Scale Model Craft. Um, today, we're going to look at the machine in Krieger that I just built, and I'm going to make this little screen a little bit bigger. And you can see right here, um, this was just, this is my first machine in Krieger. Uh, it's a, a SAFS raccoon, which, you know, this is the box, and I'll make me bigger now. Um, sorry about that. So this is the box, and um, I'll tell you, it's really cool. So SAFS stands for Super Armored Fighting Suit. Type R is for reconnaissance, and uh, Raccoon is like the name of the reconnaissance vehicle. Um, it's really fun. I've, I've really enjoyed this. You know, I, I'd seen these, and, uh, you know, there's a group that I actually joined before I even started building it that, that started with the Plastic Posse uh, a long time ago. And um, haven't built it yet, but now I just did. So I had a great time all week. And um, I, I just kind of want to talk to you about, you know, what I did. And, and I'll show you some pictures. That's what I got up here. And then, um, yeah, I'll talk to you about the, the diorama as well. So I am going to make this bigger. And we can look at some of the pictures from the build. So it's really... So far as uh, engineering, this is made uh, or produced by Wave Corporation. Um, but I would say the molding and the, the plastic and the model are really similar to like Bandai that I've gotten. It, except, and, and I've only done a couple of Bandai, except I think that the plastic is harder. Um, I was really surprised at how tough and, and how dense the plastic was on this, um, which is good because it also has the little poly pieces that make it move. So once this is built up, I guess it's meant to, you know, not necessarily be played with, but but to be animated and, and you know, put it in poses and stuff like that. Um, so for that reason, it was great. It went together great. Um, the cutting it off the sprues was, was not bad, but the sprues and the connection points to the pieces, it, it leaves a pretty good little piece that you have to shave off. So just be careful of that um, because some of them look like they might be um, because there is so much different kind of, um, I guess, detail in this. A couple of those, I'm like, is that supposed to stay there or not? So just be care careful of that, but love the kit really fun to build, super easy to build, and it's pretty small. You can kind of see it back here in the background. I'll go to this picture again. And that, um, we'll show you my background real quick. Um, right here is the Machine Krieger. It's 120th scale. And um, so it's a pretty small kit, you know, once it's all said and done. And once I built it, you know, just like anything, I kind of like to go in there and futz with it a little bit. So I added some things to it. And I'll talk about those. And I put some lights in it. And, and I got to tell you, putting lighting into this thing was super easy because the way it's constructed, you can take it apart and put it back together and work on all the internal stuff like really easy. So, um, first off, well, let's go th through some of these pictures. And um, if you're looking on the replay, go ahead and put comments down below if you've ever built one of these. This is, like I said, my first one. I haven't decided if I'm going to do a male or a female uh, head for it. You know, it comes with both, which is pretty slick. Um, and I'll probably paint them both up. You know, there might be, I I'd like to kind of check it out. And then, or, or kind of check out what each looks in it like in it and then the top comes off here the other thing is is this is a really fun part to paint this little hatch inside here all of the ones that i've seen done up well not all of them but a lot of them have that open because it's some pretty fun environment it's like padding and stuff like you'd see inside of a a suit and so it's it's more like uh painting leather seats and and stuff like that or maybe even like the inside of the Millennium Falcon, you know how it's kind of padded everywhere, but super dirty. I, I kind of think that that's something else I could look at and explore when I'm, when I'm painting it. 
But let's look at some of these pictures. Um, here, this is really interesting in the upper right hand corner, this picture up here. It's really cool because this comes apart in such a way that I can work on it super easy. And that's what's being shown here. These here left and right are like the bays or not the bays, but the almost like the sides of the body that fold out. It's, it's just made so that they fold out and, and they can continue to fold out and, and open up like that all the way through the build. It's not like I had to um, glue that in place. There's certain things I did glue, but I didn't have to glue that and I can still open it up and get in. And that's what really helped me with the, the electrical wiring and, and stuff that I did later. So um, this just shows what it looked like. No paint, obviously. I just kind of put it together. It went together pretty fast too. So um, if you're looking for like a quick build, I think I built it in a day, you know, so it wasn't bad at all. Um, so the next picture, this is after it's built. I wanted some texture because the upper body here is supposed to be, um, you know, cast. I don't know if it's like cast iron or like a cast alloy, but it's cast. And so I wanted some texture. I got a little heavy. I haven't knocked it down yet. I got to do that. But before I went on, cause I'm like, Oh, okay. I got that on there and it's built. I'm going to start looking at some paint and stuff. And, and that was my, my next part. But then I was like, you know, I, I like to do extras. And so I started in with that. And so what I did was after I got that stuff on there, this is not paint in the upper right hand corner. So this is a patch that I was kind of testing out, but this is not paint. This is where I took some uh, lacquer thinner, Tamiya lacquer thinner. Um, that thins the Mr. Surfacer 500 that I used. And I'm going to go back to a big picture of me real quick so I can show you the Mr. Surfacer. Um, the Mr. Surfacer... If you haven't used this, I've, I've only used it a little bit, but it's great because there's different um, like granularities, if you will. Uh, the 500, it has like big clumps and stuff like that. That's what you're seeing on here. Um, the 1000 and, and, and higher numbers are finer. Think of it like a sandpaper, you know, so there's, there's like little bits of stuff in there and, and the higher the number, it's, it's kind of thinner and gives less of a, a texture. Well, this 500 gives a pretty good clumpy texture. And so that's what I have here. And I really like it. You know, this is, this is pretty cool stuff. Um, but I said, you know, I, I want to have some places where it's worn. And so in this picture, that's what you're looking at. So this gray here, that's not paint. That's the, the actual plastic. So it's gone down to smooth. And that's what I wanted. I wanted it to look like these pieces of metal through just work and interaction, stuff like that had worn on each other. So I took everything and moved it because these little flaps kind of, you know, they articulate, uh, they move and articulate. I see, I got to figure out how to switch back and forth because it just makes it easier. But these are articulating like that. So I just took these and where it looked like they would kind of interact with other pieces of the suit, I wanted to kind of wear that part away. So that's what you're seeing there. Um, then that little copper piece that's kind of interesting. What I wanted to do here is do kind of a patchwork. This has been out in the field. Um, it's a pretty specialized piece of kit. This suit, I don't think you're going to do a lot of repair out in the field. Um, but if you had to, who would you talk to? And so this is po post apocalyptic, uh, post apocalyptic times. And so I think what you're looking at is finding someone with the wherewithal to, to you know, fix metal. Uh, blacksmith, farmer, that's kind of what I thought. You know, they're out and they're working. They come up on someone who's just a dirt farmer. They're trying to eke out an existence. And they were able to help them in repairing it, maybe even modifying it a little bit. So that's what this little copper piece is. So I went forward with that and did a little bit more and tried to give the little copper pieces some like some definition like they've been bolted on um and the reason i did the the bolts and stuff like that number one i like bolts i think they're fun but i know from a little experience it's really difficult to weld cast metals 
alloys or even just cast iron. You have to like heat up the whole thing. And so it's just really technically difficult to get a good weld. So just kind of ingenuity wise, I thought a farmer or a blacksmith would, uh, these are copper, you know, that I show in here, but um, they're supposed to be steel or metal. And um, they've been uh, repaired by a farmer or a blacksmith. And so that's why they look a little bit rough in this. So that's kind of what I was going with uh, or going for. Uh, and then on the big picture over here, I'll go back to that. Um, you'll see that I've got some wires coming down on this. Now those wires are lead. So that's the lead line or the lead wire that uh, I, I have talked about it before. And it's used for fly fisher people people that are making fly fishing uh, flies for fishing. Um, you use this really tiny pieces of lead that um, on your ties when you're flying them or when you're tying them, not when you're flying them. Um, hey, making model airplanes. Thanks very much for uh, stopping by. I appreciate it. <coughs> Excuse me. So I'm going to uh, take the picture and go to me a little bit more so I can show you this lead. So I got this online. And um, it comes with like three different thicknesses, two spools of each. And <coughs> excuse me, I'm sorry. Here, this is like one millimeter. And, and I don't use that much because for me, for my purposes, it's a little thick. What I tend to use are the half mil. That's what I have on the machine in Krieger and the 0.8 mil. So the 0.8 and the five are what you're going to see on the machine in Krieger here. And um, I like these. I was a little weirded out by it because I'm like, oh, it's lead and stuff, but I'm very careful. And when you put it on there, the thing about it is, is that there's no, there's no spring back. You know, when, when you try to uh, shape like wire. So here's just like some regular, like electrical wire. When I bend it, it's going to spring back. Right. And so that makes it really hard to shape. And I've done it. We've all done it. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Solder is kind of the next thing that a lot of people think of, you know, cause solder is a little bit less like that, but it still does do it. And sometimes solder has some things in it that like some acids or some flux or some embedded stuff. And, and if you're not aware of that, you put it in there and then it'll kind of corrode over time. So this works great. And look what happens when I bend it. There is just no, there's like little to no flex back. It just stays exactly where you put it. And I love this stuff. So I was able to take that then and route that on the back of the suit. And, um, and then I just use some little tie downs that I cut, like you might use it for seatbelt material. It's, um, it's like a, a kind of a thick foil. Sometimes you'll see it on wine bottles. Uh, there's some lead foil, but now they use like an aluminum or something else. They don't use lead. But um, that works great, too. And so you just cut little strips and make little connectors. And those connectors then um, make it a little bit more believable in making it stick to the suit. So that's what you see here. Um, I had a lot of fun with this. I'm, I'm using different small pieces from the, um, from the different, like, kits and, you know, uh, the scratch building stuff that I, I do all the time. And I just use that same stuff to add some of these inclusions. If you're an armor modeler, you're going to recognize some of these parts, like this part here. Um, that's like a, uh, a lot of times it's a light. It's like a blackout light that shines over a license plate or, or shines over a feature or uh, some signage maybe on a, uh, 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 like a German military vehicle. Well, this really turned out cool because the base of it sticks but the bottom of it here underneath is kind of away from the material. I, it's kind of, it's like stair step, like something. And I was able to get light out of it is what I'm trying to get out. So you'll see that, but um, yeah, it was a, a very cool uh, process of just going through here and adding stuff. And, and so that's what I did. Now, when I, when I started doing this, I thought I, I kind of want to even everything out. I don't want things to be like more here, more there. But I also thought, you know what? You're not thinking that when you're trying to add something in the field, you're just trying to make sure that it works the way you wanted. 
So this is one of the things that I thought was really fun. On the backs of these legs, um, the, these aren't, uh, uh, or I didn't like add this or something like that. These bulge back here on the back of the upper, uh, like the hamstring area were there. All I did was I cut this little hole right here and made like an ovoid or a round or a, like a slot or something like that. So it looks that when this flex, that would move back and forth. And then it is um, just a piece of brass tubing with a piece of brass rod inside it, very small, obviously. And then that connects down to this. And then once it's painted up, I think it looks really good. I'll probably also put some of the, uh, some of that uh, Mr. Surfacer on that before I do final painting, just to make it match the rest of the suit. Uh, but I did paint over it and, and it looks really, really good. So um, I just went around here and found some places where I could put stuff and then I, I wanted it to look right. Um, and so I had these, you know, sticking out lines. Well, this right here, this uh, line, is something that um, I, I like to use because this braided stuff, it's pretty easy to get, number one, and it looks a lot better than maybe some of the plastic lines. Now, I'm probably going to replace those plastic ones before I'm, uh, I'm finished. And I also wanted to kind of show you how to use this stuff. So um, I'm going to go back to this view and I'm going to show you some of this stuff. So this is that braided line. Um, and what it is, is it's shielding and you'll find it in these. So I have a few of these and you may too, uh, around. And what I found is some don't have it. Most of them do because it, it does, well, it, it, um, adds strength, but it's also like, um, uh, electrical shielding for like, uh, EMF and stuff like that. So what I do is I'll just take an old one of these. This is not an old one. But I'll take an old one of those and I'll strip it out. And you got to be really careful because it can fray. But um, when you're trying to pull line out of it, it kind of has the effect of, of wanting to grab onto the line. But there's an easy way to work with it. So if you see what I'm doing here, I'm holding it. I'm trying to make sure it's nice and um, focused. But if you push it in together, it gets thicker, right? That's just the, 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 the properties of this stuff. Or if you pull it, it gets thin. But what that allows you to do is take a piece of it. And I'm going to take a piece of it real quick here. And if I'm, I'm going to actually use this piece because I don't have a lot of this stuff. I'm going to use a piece about that long. And I'm cutting it with just my little scissors. And then I kind of thread it by using that same property. So what I'm doing is I'm, I'm, I'm kind of pushing this down. And at the end, I'm inserting... This is one of my styluses, you know, when I'm trying to work, but what it does is it's flared at the bottom. So it works really good for this. So I just insert it in there and then I work this down over the top of the stylus. And as I'm doing that, I'm opening this up. Remember how thin it was when I started. Now I've got it all put together and now it's quite large and I can work some electrical line through that. And that's what I did on here because this one, this is on the other side, and I'm going to change the big picture and show it to you. Um, it's not this line that I'm talking about, but on the opposite arm, that light right there. Do I have a picture? Oh, I don't even have a picture of it. I'm sorry. But the light that you're looking at there, I'm going to show me again and the, and the model. Um, that light is actually driven by this line right here. So that, <clears throat> excuse me, that line does not just kind of put their fake, it actually does have electrical uh, lines going through it to light the light that's in this. So um, yeah, you can actually use this stuff like it was intended and it's not too hard to work with, but there are a few things to be careful of because if you don't understand doing that, it can be a real pain. Now, once I do, have this, you know, collapsed and it's a lot larger and I can get wire through there, then I'll, I'll pull it out and it'll, it'll tighten down around that uh, line that I have in it and it just works great. So, it, and it shields the wire. 
Hey, uh, John Robeck is here. Thanks very much. Hey, Bill, happy that I'm not missing the stream as I fly across the country. The mods you are creating on that model are really great. Thanks very much, John. I, I really appreciate it. Um, and then I wonder if there's an aluminum product that works as well as the lead. You know, and, and I, that's a really good point. Um, it is lead, and we are taught that lead is super dangerous. And I'm not disputing that at all. And, and so I think you do have to be careful with it. Um, the, I've not seen another product like it, and I went for this product after uh, you know seeing other people use it, other modelers use it, and that's why I am using it. So um, it might be better to use rubber gloves with it. Um, I certainly want to, wouldn't want to ingest or to get it near your eyes or anything like that. I don't know the safety protocol for lead, but I do know that once it's in here, I'm not going to leave it bare. It will be painted just like I, I have done on here. You can kind of see I've painted that. So it will be covered and it will have like clear coat over it. So I don't think there's going to be any danger of anybody else coming in contact with it or anything like that after the fact. But yeah, working with it bare, uh, I can understand the, those concerns and, and I share in them. Um, I'm just trying to be really careful about it. And I think that works. So anyway, when I am putting these on here and I'll probably use this again, then what I'll do is I'll, I'll kind of get it in place and I want to kind of put a, like a connector around the end of it. And, and so I did that. And, and, and of course I filmed all this stuff and I'm making videos for that longer form videos. And uh, I'll show you the complete build when it's done. Um, and then John came back and said, uh, I suppose such a small amount anyway. Sure. Yeah. It, it was really small. Um, I think repeated access to it. Certainly you won't, don't want to do that with, with lead. That's, that's not a great idea. Um, excuse me. I got a little bit of a cold. Um, so the next thing that I did and, and the, the pictures are kind of showing here, I'm going to go back to those right now and kind of back up cause I, I skipped ahead. Um, was after that arm, uh, I did go into the electrical and, and, and working on the electrical on this was super easy. And, I, and I'm going to show you why. And, and it's a little bit of a rat's nest, but um, the way these little guys go together underneath here, right here. Um, and this is one of the reasons I kept these on and didn't replace them with that wire yet with that shielded wire is the legs can still come right off. So the legs, uh, I can completely remove and this plastic, it's shedding paint. So it doesn't hold paint very well. Um, and like I said, I think I'm going to replace those with that shielded cable that I just showed you. Um, but for now they help hold the, the legs on though. They don't need it. It's a real nice fit, but here in the bottom, you can see where I've drilled out just a couple of access holes and then all my electrical comes out through that. And there's plenty of room. I haven't quite decided how I'm going to hide it, you know, in the, in the final build or something like that, but I, I'm sure I can figure something out. But now we can kind of take this top and I'm just going to real gently pull the front forward. And I'm going to do two things here. Number one, I'm going to take this and just pop it out. So that is really nice because when, if you should build one of these, this comes out because this is a highly de, uh, highly painted detail. This is where the head goes. And it's like an internal compartment uh, that you would have around your head inside your helmet. And so there's a lot of great detail in there. Also in the door that closes over it, I'm trying to get that to focus. Um, so that's a lot of great detail. So you're gonna wanna paint that. So it's nice that that comes off from the completed model so you can like paint it and then put it back in the model. So that's kind of a neat feature. But inside, look at that. It is all open and it's all like, I mean, it's like an egg in there. If you look at this uh, just from the front uh, or, or from the side profile, I mean, it's an egg shape. I mean, if they utilized an egg when they originally did it, I wouldn't be surprised at all because it's a perfect egg shape for the upper portion of the suit here. Um, so when you open that up, all that is just open and it is available to put stuff in. So what I did was I put three lights in. So the first one is this here. So on the front of the suit, that is because, you know, you operate the suit with the, the, the lid closed. Um, that is like a camera, I'm assuming. 
And I'm going to try to go to a better picture on this. Yeah, so there's a much better picture. So if you look in the picture on the left-hand side of the picture, that's what this piece is. And so it sits forward and apparently looks like it scans back and forth and things like that. Well, I wanted a light in there. And so I put a green LED inside there. Um, this is a little piece I talked about a little bit earlier, and I'm going to try to change my picture so that I can show that. There, you can see where this little piece right here um, has a light behind it. And because that little shield at the base is open, the top is closed, but the base is open of it, it allows light to shine down out of it. And so I put a blue, or I, I, I had it labeled as bright. So it's like 5,600K, the, the temperature of the light um, is quite bright. So it's a bluish tint. But that against the background looks very blue and, and, it, and it kind of cascades down over the arm. And then the last uh, light that I put in is actually in the arm. So that is just an, an LED inside there. That's just a piece of um, uh, brass tubing, probably half inch brass tubing, thin wall. And then I mounted it to a spare arm that came with the kit. So the kit had an additional spare arm. And it, to me, it looked like a right arm. So that's how I mounted it. Um, and I just made, you know, that in there. So that is all the electrical that I did to it. There's no electrical running at the legs or anything like that. I thought about it. I didn't. But that's there. And then when you want to close this thing up, you got to be careful with it. You know, you got to go a little gingerly with it. But it does just snap right back together. And once it's together, <clears throat> pardon me, I've got a little battery set up here so I can light this up for you and show you. Um, and I, when I do this, there's a lot of ways to do this, obviously, but I like to use nine volt batteries. They're not cheap, but they provide a good amount of uh, time, you know, amount of time that you can have the, the batteries lit. And um, so there the lights on. Um, and uh, it, they're pretty convenient to, to replace and house and, and things like that. So I, I think the, uh, you know, lighting this thing, if you have those aspirations, very doable, super easy to light. Uh, I enjoyed it quite a bit. And running the, the lines through it was pretty simple. I mean, there's a lot of room in there to hide stuff. All my resistors are inside uh, because these lights are different. They're, they're different LEDs. I had to have three different resistors. So all three resistors are in there plenty of room. I can still get this in there. Um, I'm even thinking of maybe adding another light that I have some up lighting in this, like in the, what you would think about as the cabin, I guess, or just around your head. Um, so I might have more lighting there, but it was just super easy to work with and fun. Now, the other thing about this little light that I added to him, where is my thing? Um, I have a lens that will go in the front, I had a lens, here it is. I've got a little plastic lens right here that fits in the front of this. So when that lens is in and the light's on, it also will focus that beam just a little bit. It's not, you know, it's not like this great beam or nothing, but it focuses a little bit and it looks a little bit cooler. So that is uh, what I did with that. So the next uh, thing that I wanted to talk about was, well, okay, fine and well, what are you going to do with it? Well, the, what I'm going to do with it is I'm going to do a little diorama. I, I kind of do that. It's my thing. So the diorama that I'm thinking about is, so this, you know, this is supposed to be after, I want to say it was in the, in the Machine Krieger story. Um, I want to say it was like 2008 or something like that. There was supposed to be a nuclear exchange and, and then the fallout is it's now in the 20 some things and um, the machine Krieger universe. And this is a recon unit. So he's out looking, right? This person is in the suit and they're just out there. They're, they're looking for life. They're looking for resources. They're looking for signs of humanity. They're looking for anything, you know, and it's out there. Uh, but there's this, re this, this recon unit is a searcher basically is what I thought. So 
for the diorama idea, um, I saw something very recently that I thought was really fun online. And it was a person doing a geodesic dome. And I think they were doing like a geodesic, um, like playhouse or something like that. But in growing up, I just wanted to get to a different picture here in the background. Uh, growing up uh, in the area that we did, there was a, a geodesic home, like right off the freeway that we would pass for years, like 20, 30 years. And uh, I always had that in my mind and I always liked that. And I thought it was a neat idea. So that's what I'm going to do. I want to do a geodesic dome that is partially uh, covered up, meaning that, and, and this is a really bad illustration, but this is my uh, raccoon. That's my machining Krieger raccoon. This is supposed to be the dome right here, uh, you know, and then this is the floor of the dome right there. And it's supposed to be a huge greenhouse. Um, one of my favorite movies, well, I love the idea of, of what I saw of the movie, Silent Running. It's a kind of a depressing movie, but it's really well done. And the special effects were great. And it was the first movie I ever saw where I saw special features. I was a little kid, 70s, early, mid 70s. And that had these big, huge geodesic domes over greenhouses and and different um, uh, climates from the earth and it was out in space and great movie if you haven't seen it well i want to do something similar to that so i'm going to have a geodesic dome where the the like the ground is up here like after floods after all kinds of debris build up all that kind of stuff so it's it's like you know quite far up on the geodesic dome but the dome part like this is all going to be plexi, plexiglass. So I got to put, you know, cut out a bunch of triangles to make the geodesic dome. And then, the, of course, the framework around it. Um, and then down in it, at a lower level, it's going to be a greenhouse, but it's all dead except for this area where he's looking through here. There's like a break in the, the dome itself. It's like cracked and open and, and, and sun's getting through. Everything else is like covered with dirt and stuff. So you can't really see it. But that one spot is shining down. And then in that one area where it's shining down, there's going to be actually green plants growing in this, you know, basically burnt out dead greenhouse. There's, there's a sign of life in there. Um, and I like that. I think it's, you know, it's one of those, um, you know, it's, it's, it's not original at, at all. Uh, but I like that. I, I like that, you know, you're searching around, it's a desolate wasteland, blah, blah, blah. And you find that plant. I, I like that. It's a, it's a story of hope. It's a story of uh, rejuvenation, renewed life, blah, blah, blah. I love that. I think that's a great, great little image. And so that's, that's what I'm going to go for. Um, I've got a bunch of plexiglass. Um, and I think this is just a little bit less than an eighth of an inch. So it won't be too hard. It's covered in plastic. I'll show how to cut this stuff if you've never cut it. It's not too hard. Um, but I'll probably have to make a jig or something for the angle because the angle of those triangles has to be correct and consistent because a geodesic dome, she don't go together if you don't got it right. So, hey, thanks very much, um, uh, John. I really, really appreciate that. I think it's going to be a fun, uh, a really fun diorama. And I haven't done a lot with the Plexi for a long time. Um, this is actually scrap that I've had around from older projects. So I've worked with it a fair amount, but it's been years. So it'll be a lot of fun. Uh, you know, and everything that I do, I film. I'm not, I haven't put out the longer form videos, though I did on Tuesday of this week, I put out from the 2023 Northwest Scale Modeler Show, which was fantastic. Uh, that was a longer form video, but it was just meh. Um, but I am building and putting out longer form videos along with the shorts, along with the live streams. And so you can see those, you know, on, on the channel. And this is going to be one. I, I, I don't know if I'll come out with in like a multiple part video set yet, but I definitely want to finish the project before I put out, you know, too much of a video. It might be fine to do, okay, here's the build of the machine Krieger and the paint because the paint's next as I start the diorama but I'll be painting it as I'm working on the diorama and, and, and setting that up. 
uh, and so I could finish and do a long form video of building up, prepping, uh, everything I did to the machine, which was quite a bit, and then go into another video. I don't know why I'm discussing all this out like this, but I just want you to know what's coming. Uh, so yeah, uh, that'll be a fun video and uh, I really hope you like it. The, the diorama itself, I'm gonna do it in the classic way that I do my dioramas. I'm gonna use uh, foam, the, the, the pink foam, and, and uh, that'll all be filmed. What I'm not sure is what I'm going to do as the main structure of the geodesic dome. I've got the plastic, you know, the, the little sprue pieces. Here they are. Uh, I'm trying to find one that's a, here we go. So this one is like a, you know, looks like a girder beam, an I-beam. Um, and I like that quite a bit, the idea of doing that. Um, but there are some issues with that. I drew this because the, the, main, the main thing in construction that I have to think about and, and I have to accommodate for in building it is going to be, I'm going to get all fancy and get a red marker here for you. It's right there. It is that. Um, so the geodesic dome is, is basically made of a series of connected uh, linear structures, right? So the frame is just a linear structure. And what I need to do, <clears throat> pardon me, is have a method of connecting six of those linear structures throughout the geodesic dome. Variations of that connection, uh, four or five, whatever, can be made, but it's all about that structure that I have to be, you know, cautious of. That's, that's what I'm, I'm looking to accomplish. So do I make a little star? do I, you know, a, a six pointed star with a, a, a connection and then it comes out to this. Yeah, I, I haven't done that yet, but that's the fun of this that, you know, when I'm building a diorama, it's about trying to figure out problems that I don't know the answers to. Uh, that's why I do everything in the shop, you know, trying to figure those things out is what makes it fun. Um, uh, uh, model building, is following instructions, but you're also being creative while you're doing it. And, and that's what I try to exemplify. I really, really like that. Hey, uh, I got another John that uh, stopped in. Hey, no problem, John. You know, this is a, the, the, my off day. It's typically on Friday. So the, none, none the worse. I've just, I've got an appointment tomorrow. I've got uh, a consult that I've got somebody that is uh, actually going to be in the shop tomorrow. And we're going to do a consult. Uh, consult. It's, it's not something that I'm advertising because I'm not really doing that. This is just a special with, with somebody I've already worked with. And um, all my other consulting is, is uh, virtual and live. But I do have somebody coming in tomorrow, so that's why we're doing this here today. Thanks very much for coming in, John. So, um, yeah, it, it's, that structure is the point of solving those problems. And, again, being in a shop, being somebody who likes to create, um, creating for the end result is wonderful. It's that's kind of the payoff, right? But the joy is in the creating. The joy is solving those problems that, that for at least me, I present to myself quite a bit. Um, I don't go into these with much more of a plan than this. I and mean, you can kind of hear me talking about it. That's my planning. Um, and I know that's something that's been requested on the, on the live streams before they said, well, you know, we'd like to talk a little bit about planning. So that's, I'm trying to let you in on how I kind of think of this stuff. Now, the next point will be identifying, you know, the biggest problems that I can identify. Now there will be other problems that come up in the process that I haven't identified yet. And I'll, I, I'll do that and I'll problem solve those at that time. But right now, I'm just thinking forward, thinking, yeah, that's what I got to solve. So now what I'll do is I'll just pile into it. I'll go online. I've got some reference books. Um, I've even got some friends who are architects. I've got some friends that do uh, engineering and uh, mechanical engineering. And I'm not going to say design this for me at all. I would just talk to them and say, present the problem like if you were doing this, what would you do? Is there anything that you would look out for? I mean, that's research. You know, it's not just 100% online. It doesn't have to be 100% where I'm, I'm getting uh, into YouTube and I'm, and I'm buying books, though that can certainly be a part of it. 
It could also just be talking to, to some of your friends that, that have these capabilities or people you've had acquaintances with. Um, if there's somebody that you don't know and you'd like to ask them, just ask them. That's the biggest thing. Uh, hey, Ken is here. Uh, figure out how to do as part of the joy in model making. Absolutely, Ken. I 100% I, I, I agree. Um, I tried to explain this to some people some time ago that aren't builders, that aren't creators, that aren't, I mean, they're problem solvers, but they, they didn't equate problem solving with building something, be it a cabinet or a model or a diorama. I mean, you know, these people just think, well, you just, you go find a plan and then you build to the plan. Well, that's not really how it works. You know, from looking from outside, looking in, that might be what you think, but what you're doing is constantly taking those plans and saying, that's, that's basically a map, but that doesn't get me there. I've got to utilize my skills, my tools, my environment, my materials, and try to match what those plans say. And a lot of times that's not explained to the plan. So that's a very fun activity. Um, problem solving and sussing things out and figuring things out. Um, is, is really what it's all about. And, and for me, again, as Ken said, that's the joy in it. And uh, I, I, I really believe that. Um, so thanks very much, Ken. Very, very on point, sir. So um, that's really kind of what I came out here to say. I, I want to just show you the, um, the uh, Machine and Krieger. If you have any questions about the Machine and Krieger and the build, I'm going to answer some of those, you know, during the videos that I'm making. But I'm, I'm certainly able to answer them now. And if you have questions, I'd love to talk to you about it. If you haven't built a Machine and Krieger, they're really neat kits. Now, they're not inexpensive kits, and they can be a little bit difficult to find sourcing them. Sometimes the exact kit you want is a little bit difficult. There's not, they're not necessarily in all the, the different, uh, you know, stores that you're, you know, you're looking or you're, you're, you're typically going to. Um, so you, you do want to kind of look around and, and try to source it um, maybe online, but um, I'm trying to get to a better picture. There we go. Um, I got to tell you, it's really fun. And, if you're not into mech, I, I, I wasn't like into mech or anime or, or Gundam or anything like that, but I've been exposed to it now. And this for me is a beautiful entry point because to me, it's like a walking tank. It's something that I can recognize. The Gundam, though, I, I obviously have been around a long while and, and, and I've seen Gundam and even Transformers, if you want to go in that direction, um, just wasn't part of my childhood whereas something like this this began in the 80s because it harkens to kind of like a, a walking tank i just connect with it a little bit more I, I have some gundam and i'm really excited to try them but for this i'm 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 kind of i'm liking it a lot um and like i said it's very well engineered goes together great i didn't i didn't really have to fuss with anything to get it together I only had to fuss with stuff that I decided I wanted to change and alter. And because the plastic is so tough, it's really some strong plastic. The, the, the hardest plastic I've come up on uh, in working with models, uh, definitely the hardest plastic I've, I've worked with. Um, but that's good because it's going gonna, it's gonna to stand up to a lot. I have dropped it multiple times uh, working on it. Hasn't damaged it a lick. Nothing. So... Pretty neat stuff. Okay. So that is about all I had. Oh, uh, I got another one here from John that he said, for that connection point, I personally would 3D print this, the parts, the angles are consistent. That's a really good point, John. I, I do have um, my 3D printer, you know. I wonder how tough it's going to be. So one of the examples I saw was just a little bracket. And if you will, on the end of each of these, the it was that one was wood, which would be easy to do. I don't know if it would be realistic for what I'm trying to do though. But what they basically did was they just took and put a little tab that came out of it with a hole, you know, so it was just a rounded over tab that came out of the end of the 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 wooden block and then on, on, on the end of every stick or, or every structural member. And then you just put one 
uh, bolt through it. I mean, it works. Super simple. It's not necessarily what I'm looking for. I want to look. I want to have something that's that looks like it's an advanced um, construction methodology. You know, uh, a little bit more high tech. Three um, D printing would lend itself to that too. Um, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure. It's only going to be part of the geodesic dome. So that's that's kind of one thing. I only have to do a little bit of it. And it, and it might be like a quarter of the dome because as I have in my little drawing here, uh, most of it is going to be underground. So here's the surface of the ground is here. And this is all subterranean. And you're going to see it. You're going to view it from this side. Well, you can see it from, from all the way around. You can see it. But um, the primary angle that this guy is going to be uh, is kind of looking down and you would be see him peering through the geodesic dome. So um, yeah, those end connectors, those are, those are one of the big deals. And uh, I think like I was saying, doing a star, doing something again, repeatable um, that would connect all those ends. Then I can make the ends of, of uh, any length that I want. And when I get that end length figured out, I want them this length, then I can cut my plexi because that's the dimension that I'll need uh, for each of the equilateral sides of the triangle. So, and I, and here's the other question. Are the triangles in a geodesic dome equilateral? I don't know that. They might be, I don't even know the name for it, but I got two long sides and a short. Huh, I don't know. I don't believe so, but I think they're all equilateral, but these are things I have to, you know, source out. Um, so yeah, I'm going to start that this weekend and, and, and I'm super excited about it because I haven't done a, a, a diorama for a little while. Um, and when I do it and once I start into it, it'll start that whole process of building itself. I'll find little things, uh, little mistakes. A lot of times will become something will become a feature will become an element, you know, something to draw the eye. I, 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 I'm trying to come up with something snappy that, that sounds like I know what I'm talking about, but there's things that I concentrate on when I'm building a diorama and it's color and it's feature and it's, it's um, like texture because those are the things that I think draw your eye to it. You know, a bright color can draw your eye, a feature, whatever, or like a texture, like a rock or a tree or certain kind of ground and color, blah, blah, blah. That'll draw your eye. But there's there's three elements that I'm trying to kind of boil it down to to say, hey, these are the things I really concentrate on. Because I do it, I just don't know how to vocalize it properly. So it, it sounds like, you know, something you can you can remember. Um, but I want to do that because I think that that is, it, it sometimes make it easy, makes it easier to get, you know, a message across. Uh, because the most important thing is, is I want people to, if they should like what I'm doing, eh? you know, in something and they think that they can use that in their own design, well then grab it and go and use it, you know, modify it for your own use. Uh, the re the reason I'm here is to try to tell you what I've learned by watching other people do it because I've put my spin on it. I think it's a little bit unique from what other people are doing. And if I can share it with you, you pick it up and then you make your own unique thing out of it. Well, there you go. How cool is that? So um, that's the, the, the things that I'm, I'm pretty, uh, involved in trying to find the best way to get across to you as you're watching my videos and my live streams and all that. So there is a couple of things I want to talk about. I, I am pretty excited. Um, well, number one in doing this process, I, uh, found out who Lincoln Wright is. Um, if you don't know who Lincoln Wright is, uh, and I will post his, um, his web channel uh, in the video after the fact. Um, he worked uh, in Japan for 25 years. I believe he's Australian. I don't know. I haven't researched him. I've only watched a few of his videos, but they're really great, really splendid. And he worked with the people who created Machine and Krieger. He worked in the art studios. He did some of, uh, he's done writing. And so he's done books on Machine and Krieger. I think he did the first Western book on Machine and Krieger. Um, if you haven't, if you're interested in Machine and Krieger and you haven't seen Lincoln Wright, please check him out. Great videos, uh, lots of great information. But one of the things that a friend of mine, uh, who's actually coming over tomorrow while we're doing this today, why we're doing this today, 
um, sent me a video that showed me all the base colors that were in the machine and Krieger kind of uh, uh, world. You know, what were the base colors that they used? And so I wrote them all down and then I converted some of them to just the, the Tamiya paints that I had. I, you know, I could go out and buy just like the exact paints because uh, he references Mr. Color. Uh, I've got a Mr. Color over here. He, you know, references Mr. Color for the, the paints that he likes to use uh, and the paints that were originally used on the original Machine Kriegers. Um, but I just have this and I only had a little bit of Mr. Color. So I did convert those. So I'll, I'll put my conversions in the notes of the, of the, uh, or the description of the video as well. Um, and then the other thing I want to talk about is I am going to start doing, so one of the things that I do do now is consulting. I've talked about that a little bit, uh, earlier. And so I'm going to be setting up some one-on-one -on -one meetings. Uh, they're 30 minute meetings. And it's not like this where you're just texting, you know, questions stuff like that. It's a live one-on-one -on -one meeting with one of my Patreon. Well, each of my Patreon folks, I don't have a lot of Patreon folks, but each of my Patreon folks. And what I'm doing is I'm testing out a new tier that I'm going to add to Patreon a little bit later on this month. And that will include a 30 minute consult included with your patreon membership like i'm not sure if it's every month or every three months i would do it because i don't know if somebody's going to want to talk to me every month but if they do i think that would be awesome and so it'll have you know it's a 30 minute meeting one-on-one -on -one, we discuss what you're doing maybe my ideas for what could help or if you have questions directly about a procedure stuff like that there'll be like a pre-qualification for it and, and then like, so I want to be set up basically. It's like, okay, we're going to talk about groundwork. Boom. We're going to talk about trees. Boom. We're going to talk about lead. Boom. You know, so that kind of thing. And so I'll set that up. That's going to be with all my Patreon folks. If you're not a Patreon uh, uh, member or, or patron, I guess uh, you can go and sign up. It's not very expensive on my Patreon. And then you, cause I'm going to do it with all my patrons. I only have a few. And then at the end of the month, after I do those tests and, and have those means and see how it goes and see what people are mostly liked in, then, or, or most interested in, then I will create the tier that will include that as uh, part of the Patreon uh, tier that you, you join. So I think that'll be a lot of fun. Um, and, and that's going to start March 6th. So that's next Monday. Uh, the other thing is um, John Hayes. Now he's not on today, but John Hayes uh, has been on a lot of these and uh, uh, he had questions about the display case. How am I able to remove and replace the glass or plexi? Um, and I want to make sure that I answer that. So I am building and it might be next week's. I don't know, but I've got a bunch of video footage and some that I, I shot after John asked the question of exactly that in my different displays. And so I want to show the different methods that I use, because there are different methods, um, of mounting and removing glass inside the displays I make. So if you're making a display, maybe it'll be some ideas for how you're gonna do it. Um, so I'm putting together a video on that, some new footage, some archival, and I don't know if it'll be next week, but it's coming. So John Hayes, look out for that if you get a chance to see this video. Um, and making model airplanes true. I'm not exactly sure about the true for what, but awesome. Uh, very exciting. Looking forward to it. Thanks very much, John. Uh, it, I'm very excited about this diorama as well. I think it'll be a lot of fun. Um, I think it's going to be one of those things where I dive into it and then I might have to get more kits. I've only got this kit going in. So Sometimes I do that. So I hope it's not an extended diorama. It's not meant to be a huge one. And, and frankly, there's a lot of it that I can make. It's just the, like, I'm thinking hydroponics, all kinds of stuff. So anyway, I think it'll be a lot of fun. Uh, I hope you're going to enjoy it. Uh, and like I said, I'm starting this weekend on it. I just got to figure out a couple of things because I might have to go buy a crud load of these, not exactly these, but just a bunch of this uh, for that framing that I'm going to do. So thank you, everybody. I really appreciate it. We try to go for an hour to an hour and a half. It's just about an hour on this one. So that's awesome. Thank you so much for showing up. 
Uh, if you're rewatching it, please, you know, give me your impressions uh, in, in the comments. Uh, if you're watching now, uh, throw me your stuff. I do read all this stuff, obviously. Um, and, and I want to answer all your questions, just like I'm trying to do for John. So uh, thank you very much. I hope everybody has a great Friday tomorrow and then has a wonderful weekend following that. And then next week, we'll be back to Friday for the live stream at 12 noon on Friday. Thanks very much. Have a good day. We'll see you.